Uh, my name's Tam. I'm one of the 35 Yeoman Warders, also known as Beef Eaters, here at the Tower. Uh, and for the next five hours, I'm going to be your guide. Yeah. <laughs> uh, together we'll tour the Tower. I'll point out some of the more historic buildings. I'll tell you just a little bit about the Tower's nearly 1,000 years of history. Does that sound okay? Yeah. 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 Cool. Uh, for any of that nonsense, let's get a little bit better acquainted. So, uh, anyone here from the Southern Hemisphere? Anybody? Right. Any Australians? No? All that one there. Welcome home. Who's <laughs> <laughs> here from the US of A? Very FBI. I know I can smell pancakes. <laughs> Any Canadians? <coughs> no? Thank God for that. <laughs> Anybody from Europe? Any Europeans amongst us? Where are you guys from? Spain. Irish. Oh, you're Irish? Yeah. Why then? Where are you guys from? Finland. Finland. Good to see you. Uh, who's here from the United Kingdom? Right, well done, good. That is in Europe. <laughs> Maybe. No, we're not. Yes. I'm not going there. Right, wherever you're from, guys, you're all very, very welcome. Uh, just to allay any fears you have for the next hour, I'm going to be telling you tales of torture. <laughs> there will be stories about murders. Yeah! And my favourite subject, Execution! <laughs> you can do this too. Oh. Right, uh, due to which time, I do want to hear plenty of cheers. Yeah. 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 There might be some groans. Oh. Even some moans. Mm. Not bad, it's nearly a groan, but it was almost a groan. <laughs> right then, we're uh, So, let's get on with it here. Eh? Bit better, yeah? Right, so our story begins here way, way back. On the 14th of October, 1066 to be precise, when William, the Duke of Normandy, who later become much better known as William the... <laughs> defeated the Anglo-Saxon King Harold Godwinson in that very famous battle of... <laughs> well done, thank you. Now, William's crowned King William I of England on Christmas Day that year. However, he had to continue to fight his newly conquered subjects as he didn't take very kindly to Norman domination. So what does he do? Well, he then decides to build a citadel to impress and to overawe the citizens of London. And he chose a site just inside the eastern city wall where once an old Roman fort had stood. And it was here in the year 1078, he would then authorize the building of his first royal palace and fortress in England. Now today, we refer to this as the White Tower. And it is situated just behind the buildings over here. No point looking, guys, it's just behind the buildings. <laughs> However, we'll get a good look at it just a little bit later in the tour. Now then, over the next 200 years, successive monarchs continued to add to the defences. The inner bailium or defensive wall containing 13 smaller towers was completed between the years 1220 and 1240. The outer wall was completed in 1280 and it contains six further towers. And they're all along the south to defend against an attack coming up the river. Now to the north, we've got two strong bastions called Brass Mount and Legs Mount, which is in the corner here. Inside and on top of it, they mount a cannon to defend the tower against attack from that northerly direction. And in particular, those ferocious Scots like me. <laughs> <laughs> now our third line of defense was the moat or ditch. Once filled with water, it goes all the way around the tower and we're obviously stood in it this afternoon. Now this was dug during the reign of King Edward I and he brought in an expert to do this, a Master Walter from the Netherlands. Now that moat was some 120 feet wide and when fully excavated, 15 feet deeper than it is today. And it was designed to use the tidal flow of the River Thames. Twice a day water would flow into and around the moat to keep it clean. And this system seemed to work rather well at first because all the rubbish that was thrown into it and all the excrement, that poor kids, all the dead animal carcasses from the meat market, and the occasional dead tourist. <laughs> and the largest cesspit in London, and a source of pestilence and disease to those who live nearby, especially the 1,000 soldiers of the Towers Garrison. Now, being the progressive nation we are, 
this situation then continued for the next 500 years. <laughs> Until in 1843, the then constable of the Tower of London, the Duke of Wellington, asked permission from Queen Victoria to have the moat drained. This was granted, the Duke then had it filled in with sand and shingle up to the height we see it today. Now, as I just said, this was the first royal palace and fortress of its kind to be built in England. And obviously, over all these years, it's been used for several different things. The White Tower was a royal residence right up until 1603. The last monarch to reside here, King James I. The crown jewels and all that lovely royal regalia have been safely stored here since 1303. The royal mint was located within these walls with all the coins the realm were produced and it was the site of the first ever Royal Observatory, where we studied the stars and the planets, until that eventually moved to Greenwich in 1675. Now it was even the Royal Menagerie, or Zoo, where all the animals given as gifts to the kings and queens were kept until 1835, when they got shipped out up to Regent's Park to help establish London Zoo. Last, but no means least, this must run as the most famous prison complex in the world. Now, talking of prisoners, have you kindly looked just how behind you, up in the hill there, slightly to the left, we see that tall, prominent white building has got the statues in it, yes? Yes. yes? yes. Now, as such, that magnificent building there has got absolutely nothing to do with the Tower of London. <laughs> I just happen to like it, look, it's lovely. <laughs> it is also a useful landmark. So let me tell you about the open area in front of it that does have a lot to do with the Tower. It's called Trinity Square Gardens, and it stands in that area known as Tower Hill. This was the site of many executions between the 14th and 18th centuries. Now, King Edward IV, for example, he put a permanent scaffold up there in the year 1465. Such was the frequency of executions at that period. And over the years, no less than 125 men of noble birth were to lose their heads up there by means of block and axe. Now, our first victim was Simon Sudbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And he was murdered <laughs> up there at the hands of peasants. Oh. All you people. <laughs> 1381, for daring to introduce a poll tax. Mm. Mm. Now, seven years later in 1388, the first legal execution up there was that of a man named Sir Simon Burnley. And by a truly remarkable coincidence, our last ever victim up on Tower Hill in 1747 was another Simon. Simon Fraser the Lord Lover, an 80-year-old Scottish Lord who had supported the Second Jacobite Rebellion. Now, gents, if your name is Simon, kindly put your hand up for me now. Oh, well, we got one. I'll speak to you later, sir. We'll sort you out. Don't worry. Sir. Now then, just for a moment, let's have a little pause. And imagine the sight and scene up there on a day of execution. Thousands of people, literally thousands of people, would have gathered around that raised platform, the scaffold, to witness the proceedings. It was a proper family day out, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, it really was, yeah. <laughs> on a nice day, no doubt, a nice picnic blanket would have been strewn on the ground. The ladies would have had a lovely chill prosecco. The gents would have been a hearty bottle of ale or a nice stout. For the kids, there was bowls of cheesy puff balls and potato chips going around. There was dancers and singers, there was fire eaters and there was jugglers. Everyone was having an absolutely fantastic time. <laughs> Except for one man. <laughs> <laughs> now our prisoner, having paid his executioner to do a good job, having then delivered his final and possibly quite long speech and said his prayers, he would kneel down and place his neck on a block of solid oak. And when ready, he would turn to his executioner and he would give him the given word or the prearranged signal. <laughs> <laughs> the executioner would then bring down that mighty axe, hopefully beheading his victim with one clean stroke. Now by law and tradition, he would then pick up that severed, still bleeding head. And he would hold it aloft for all to see. Turning to the assembled crowd, he would proclaim, Behold, the head of a traitor. So that all traitors, God save the king. And everyone would go absolutely wild. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. We're doing that again. <laughs> this time, I want some wildness. Got it? <laughs> but wait for it. <laughs> Behold the head of a traitor. So die all traitors. God save the king! <laughs> Absolutely pathetic. <laughs> now the head would then be impaled onto a soldier's pike. And then it would be carried through the streets of London towards London Bridge. Now guys, after three, I want you all to point out to me exactly where London Bridge is. One, two, three, go! Not an Arizona, that's a beheading offence here, that. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, thank you very much. we got quite a few going that way. There's one or two going that way. <laughs> Gentlemen at the back done this. <laughs> so for clarity, this is Tower Bridge. Yes? A magnificent piece of architecture and engineering, I'm sure we'll agree. Yep. London Bridge is indeed the next bridge up this way. And anyone that has seen that bridge will also agree. It is absolutely boring. <laughs> but here's my point. In those days, it was the only bridge across the Thames. And so those heads would then be impaled on spikes, sometimes tarred or even boiled, above the entrance into the city there as a sign of the fate that awaited all would-be traitors. Meanwhile, the headless corpse would come off the scaffold. It would be placed in a handcart, then brought back into the tower, where it would be then quickly buried in an unmarked traitor's grave in the Chapel Royal of St. Peter Ad Vincula. Now, we are just about to embark on the same route those headless corpses would have taken. And as we do so, we're going to go underneath the Biber Tower archway over here. As you're going under, guys, please have a look up and you'll see the spikes of the portcullis, or as it's also known, Norman Dropgate. It weighs over one and a half tonne and it dates from the year 1326. It is one of two surviving working portcullis we have at the tower, and I'll point the other one out just a little bit later as well. Also, no doubt, as you're going underneath, you will see the three circular holes drilled through the stonework above your head. They are known as murder holes, and they were probably used by the defenders of that tower to pour boiling oil or hot sand onto would-be attacker trying to gain entry from this direction. Okay, are we all good to move on? Yes. yes. Okay, then, let's go. Make way for me, like Moses. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Okay, guys, here we are now standing in the outer wall of the Tower of London. Uh, that's the same between the inner and outer bailiums or defensive walls. Now, the inner wall is 50 feet high, the outer wall behind us here is over 28 feet thick. <coughs> Now up this way to my right, we've got Mint Street. So named because it was here until the year 1810, so all the coins of the realm were designed and produced. <laughs> now the buildings that house the Mint are also known as the casemates or houses stroke dwellings within the walls. And they're now used as accommodation for some of my Yoma Warden colleagues and their families. Right, quick hands up guys, who knew that we actually lived at the Tower of London? Oh, quite a few, yeah. Who didn't know? Uh-huh. Who? Couldn't care less. <laughs> right, over this way, guys, we've got a tall narrow archway here. This is known as the Sally Port or the Royal Entrance. Beyond which, it was a small drawbridge leading out to the Queen's Stairs, then directly on to the River Pet. So rather than travel through the narrow packed streets of London, royalty and nobility would travel in their impressive barges along the river. They would type alongside the stairs outside there, then with very little difficulty, they'd gain access to the tower. Now, the gates just beyond the opening there are the original gates. And they date back well over 700 years. And that those very gates there, that so you the gates, so lovely and sweetly, greeted his second wife, Queen Anne Boleyn, mother of Queen Elizabeth I, on the eve of their wedding. And on a bended knee, he promised to love her for the rest of her life. <laughs> <laughs> that poor Anne was fated to just three years later, for a very different reason, and through a very different gate, more of which later. 
Now, in front of us here, we have the bell tower. Can any of the kids tell me why it's called the bell tower? Good job. Right, I'm going to ask the question again, and you're going to give your best loud voice to the answer, yeah? Why is it called the bell tower? Because it has a bell! Yay! <laughs> well done. Uh, no, it doesn't. Yeah, it does. It, I'm all kidding. It does, it does, it does. It actually contains the oldest surviving curfew and alarm bell in the city of London. And when sounded in an alarm, that would have been the signal for all the gates to be closed, the drop gates lowered, then all these battlements manned for defence. Now it's still sounded at the end of every day to let all you lovely people know the tower grounds are now closing. The bell tower is actually the strongest of the 13 on the inner wall. It stands on a solid base of masonry some 30 feet deep, 20 feet of it below ground and 10 feet above. There are two circular chambers inside, with the walls 10 feet thick at the bottom, tapering to 8 feet thick at the top. So as you can imagine, due to its form of construction, Quite a few prisoners have been held within these walls. The man for all seasons, Sir Thomas Moore, the one-time Lord Chancellor of England, he was held in the lower chamber for refusing to sign the Act of Supremacy, thereby acknowledging King Henry VIII as the head of the Church of England. At the same time, and for the very same reason, John Fisher, the Bishop of Rochester, he was held in the upper room, which is also known as the Strong Room. Now, both these men were to suffer terribly, but neither could be persuaded to abandon their religious beliefs, and they were finally taken out in June and July of 1535, up on the Tower Hill for public beheading. 400 years later, in 1935, both those men were canonised as saints of the Roman Catholic faith. Another famous prisoner held in the strong room was the young Princess Elizabeth Tudor. Now, her half-sister, Queen Mary Tudor, had reason to believe that Elizabeth was implicated in the Sir Thomas Wyatt Rebellion of 1554, which was against the Queen's plan to marry Philip II of Spain. Now, fortunately, Elizabeth was proved to be innocent, but vanished for a time to Woodstock Palace. Yet, within a brief space of just four years, she would return back here to the Tower to prepare for her very own coronation but it would prove to be her last visit here in her long reign of nearly 45 years. Quite possibly something to do with the facts she was held prisoner up there for over two and a half months and her mother had been executed here. I think it maybe put her off the Tower of London. <laughs> Just a teeny little bit, yeah? Now, it is time for a grim and grisly tale of execution. Are you ready? Yeah. Yes. We'll see you in a minute. <laughs> right, James Scott, the Duke of Monmouth. Anybody had heard of James Scott? No? He was actually the eldest of the 13, and if you're going to quibble, some people do say 14, illegitimate children of King Charles II. Now, King Charles II was also known as the Merry Monarch or the Happy King. Where he got that name from, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> However, after the death of his father in 1685, this extremely handsome and very popular young man was persuaded to stake his claim to the throne by virtue of his uncle, James II, being Roman Catholic. <coughs> Excuse me. And to press home this claim, he then landed with a small army in the west country of England, and he marched inland gathering popular Protestant support in what's now known as the Monmouth or Pitchfork Rebellion. Now, unfortunately for our dashing young hero, his revolt was crushed at the Battle of Sedmore on the 6th of July, 1685. Boo! Yeah. But the Duke escaped the battlefield! Yeah. And he made a capture! Yeah. For just a week. <laughs> He was found hiding and cowering in a ditch. Now, condemned to death in his absence, there was no need for a trial. And so just three days later, he was led out from here at the bell tower, up on the tower hill. And it would prove to be the bloodiest execution ever to take place in English history. Now, our execution of that fine morning was a man named Jack Ketch, a giant at six feet eight tall. Now, Ketch, he was actually a part-time executioner. He was also a part-time butcher. 
<laughs> but he was very much a full-time and wholly committed alcoholic. <laughs> and on this particular morning, he managed to combine that unique skill set to dramatic effect as he took five strokes of the axe to attempt to sever the head from the body. Mm. Now the first blow came crashing down with all his might, but it missed the neck completely. And it went through Jane Scott's left shoulder. Oh. And the blade stuck. And so to get the axe back out, Ketch had to put his foot on James Scott's head and he wrenched that axe back up again, splitting bone upwards and spraying the crowd with pink from the arterial blood. <laughs> this made James Scott wriggle just a little bit. And as the second blow came down, he moved and the top of his scalp was taken clean off. Three further blows were attempted, yet still that head remained stubbornly attached to the torso. Now exhausted and panicking, what does Ketch do? Well, he improvised and he took out his blunt butcher's carving knife, pushed that head back and proceeds to hack and saw between the bone, the gristle, the muscle, the tissue, the sinew, until that head was eventually free from the shoulders, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. Hey, you paid for this. <laughs> now our story doesn't quite end there. I said earlier that the heads would be displayed on London Bridge, the bodies brought back here for a burial. Yes? yes. yes. Not this time, <laughs> as both head and body were brought back into the tower before being sewn back together again oh. and buried some 24 hours later. And the reason? At the time, it was thought that no official portrait exists of the Duke. Now, he is the eldest son of a king. We must and we shall have a portrait. And so an artist and a surgeon were summoned to complete their respective roles before that body was eventually laid to rest, ladies and gentlemen. Now I can see a few sceptical looks. So I'll prove my point. If you go to the National Portrait Gallery in Trafalgar Square, you will find a portrait of the Duke of Mormon. And in this portrait, he wears a very high, unfashionable collar and looks a little bit bemused. <laughs> Check it out for yourselves, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> right then, we're off around the corner very shortly. We're off to Traitor's Gate in the bloody tower, yeah? yeah. However, just before we go, I've been practicing a new joke. And for the very first time ever, I'm about to unleash it on you poor, unsuspecting people. Are you ready? Yeah. Yes. Okay, here goes. <clears throat> Let's be heading off! <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Chop, chop, let's go. <laughs> Come on, let's swing in quick. Study at the most famous, or I should say infamous gate in the world, Traitor's Gate. Now, this was built on the orders of King Edward I because it required a safer and a more useful entrance into the tower. So rather than travel through those narrow, twisting streets of London where his convoys may be attacked, his stores get stolen or even prisoners set free, he decides to use the River Thames as a highway. So then at high tide, boats could pass through this gate here, then unload their cargo in relative safety. Therefore this gate was originally known as the Watergate. Now, where's all my new friends from the US of A? <laughs> Kindly put your hands up again, be proud of your lovely country. Yes, we had it first. <laughs> <laughs> Ours didn't leak. <laughs> Now then, having just punched a hole in the outer defensive wall, the king quickly realised he'd actually weakened the defences of the premier fortress in the land. So then commanded a tower be built above the gate to defend it. This tower is now named in honour of a former constable of the Tower of London, St Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was murdered on the steps of Canterbury Cathedral in the year 1170 on the years of King Henry II. Uh, on the orders, did I say the years? On the orders of King Henry II. Now, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, now let's get here. Fame, much of famous proofs here. I'm all talking about four queens of England who also brought through these gates, yeah? Queen Anne Boleyn, Queen Catherine Howard, Lady Jane Grey, the uncrowned queen of only nine days, whose stories I'll tell a little bit later. The young Princess Elizabeth Tudor was also brought through these gates, and we've talked about her at the Bell Tower. High dignities of the church were no exception. Archbishop Cranmer, Bishop Latimer and Ridley, for example, they were brought into the tower during the reign of Queen Mary Tudor, who was also known as Bloody Mary. 
that these three pious men were then later taken up to Oxford, where they were burnt at the stake for heresy. Those and many poorer unfortunate souls would have travelled down the River Thames from their trials at London's Guildhall or the Palace of Westminster. They would pass through these gates here and then land at these steps, where they were met by the yeoman jailer and an escort of extremely handsome yeoman warders. <laughs> They'd be taken through the bloody tower archway to the dungeons or cells, there to await whatever fate had in store for them. And for quite a few of them, it would have been a short journey back out of the tower to their place of execution. Now, behind us, guys, we've got the Wakefield Tower. Its present name recalls the services of one William de Wakefield, who was King's clerk to Edward III. So then, during that 30 year long little family squabble between the Plantagenet houses of York and Lancaster, that we now refer to as the Wars of the Roses, it is reported and recorded by tradition that the deposed Lancastrian King Henry VI was murdered in the upper chamber of that tower there by that ghost on the 21st of May 1471, either being stabbed or bludgeoned to death. Now, Henry VI is also remembered as the founder of Eton College Windsor and King's College Cambridge. And each year on the anniversary of his death, provost from those two great places of learning come here to the tower to lay posies of white lilies for Eton and white roses for Cambridge. Each tied with a ribbon in the college colours and in their place on the exact spot where he's reputed to have met his death whilst at prayer. And if you want to have a look at that spot, guys, if you take the stairs here to my left, go through the medieval palace, you'll come out there and you'll be able to have a look at that spot for yourselves, OK? Now, immediately adjacent to the Wakefield Tower is the infamous Bloody Tower! Ta -da -da. Ta -da. It was actually originally known as the Garden Tower because it overlooked and it gave access to the lieutenant's garden. Its name was changed to the Tower of Blood, or Bloody Tower, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, to commemorate the many tragedies that have been enacted within it. But surely the most tragic must be the alleged murders of the two boy princes in 1483. The young, uncrowned King Edward V and his younger brother Richard, Duke of York, who were aged just 12 and 9, and who were smothered to death whilst living in the Bloody Tower under the protection of their uncle, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, who had had those two boys declared bastard and had then taken the throne to become King Richard III. Now, their little bodies were bundled down the stairs that led to the Wakefield Tower, then very quickly buried under a pile of stones. The next day, they were moved by a priest and then reburied in a secret plot under some stairs on the south side of the White Tower. And there they remained undisturbed for 191 years, until workmen during the reign of King Charles II discovered a chest in the year 1674. Now, no doubt at that time, they would have excitedly prized that chest open, hoping to see gold, maybe silver, or a few precious gems. But instead, they found the remains of two small bodies. Now, experts of the day declared they were indeed those missing princes. And so, on orders of the king, they were eventually moved up to Westminster Abbey, then reinterred in Innocent's Corner, where they remain to this very day. It is one of the biggest whodunits of British history, ladies and gents. Much better than anything that Agatha Christie could have ever dreamt up, believe me. It's worth a bit of your own time, a bit of personal research, even. Then you can make your own minds up. Who, if anyone, committed that alleged dastardly deed? I shall say no more on the subject, because believe me, it is very, very contentious here. Now, just before we move on again, I said I would show you a second drop gate, and here is here in the Bloody Tower Arch, where I was there. Now, this portcullis actually weighs over two and a half tonnes, and it dates from the early 16th century. The single flimsy rope that holds it up is also from the early 16th century. <laughs> one of these days, guys, one of these days. Right then, we're going through there now. <laughs> I suggest we move quite quickly. Yes! Yes! Let's go then. Can I squeeze through, guys? <laughs> Ten your cup, come on. Come on. <coughs> there we go. Is everybody doing all right? Yep. Yeah, we're nearly there, we're nearly there. Hang in there. 
Jamie Ladies and gentlemen, now standing in the inner ward of the Tower of London. Sorry. To your front stands Williams Norman Keep, the White Tower, the largest tower within our complex. And as I said earlier, what began on this building here in the year 1078, and it took over 20 years to complete under the direction of a man named Gundolf of Beck, the Bishop of Rochester, who was also an architect. Now, I said Gundolf of Beck. Not Gandalf the Grey, everybody happy? Yeah? <laughs> now the tower stands just over 90 feet tall and the walls taper in thickness from 15 feet thick at the base to 11 feet thick at the top. On each corner stands a turret. Three of those turrets are square and one is round. And it's in the northeast corner that the round one there that the first ever Royal Observatory was established. Now if you look at the top of the turrets, you should be able to make out a crown in gold leaf beneath which is a weather vane showing the royal standard. <coughs> this denotes that the Tower of London is still very much a working royal palace, but obviously no longer a royal residence. But never lose sight of the fact, guys, that all our kings and queens lived here one way or another for well over 500 years. Now, the royal family would have lived mainly on that top floor. On the floor below there was a banquet and hall, a council chamber, there was accommodation for knights and ladies, and the chapel of St John the Evangelist, which is still in there to this day, and definitely worth having a look at should you have the time to do so. Now the lowest floor that now has windows was occupied by the servants and retainers. There is another floor, and it is partly below ground level. And in here, quite naturally, stores and provisions were kept. However, other parts of that floor had a far more sinister use, as it was the dungeon and torture chamber. And it was in here that the rack and other hideous instruments, such as the scavenger's daughter, would have been used on poor, unfortunate victims. Dark! No. <laughs> evil place! It was lit only by the small candles of those torturers. No sound of any cries of pain or anguish or pleas for mercy would have been heard through those thick, thick walls. Now today, guys, you can go inside and you'll find it brightly lit. And very little trace of its former use remains. Yet still it is dark. It is evil. Some say even satanic. And gentlemen in particular perspire at the mere thought of pushing through the thick, heavy, wooden door. Because Beyond that door these days, ladies and gentlemen, you will find a gift shop. <laughs> oh God. You won't laugh when you see the prices. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's why I said, oh God. Now then, this is the place where all our kings and queens live. Shortly I'll take you and I'll show you the spot where some of them very tragically died. But our short stay here wouldn't be complete if I didn't mention the Towers Ravens. Now these large flat birds are very popular with our visitors. The ravens were probably here way before any of the towers were built, nesting in the trees, then later took to the turrets. Now over the years, <coughs> superstition, myth, legend, dating from the time of King Charles II, states that if ever the ravens leave the Tower of London, then the White Tower will crumble into dust, and thus our monarchy shall fall. So, to ensure this doesn't happen, we are mandated by a written and then signed royal decree to maintain an establishment of six ravens. And we provide them with a daily ration of healthy food. Now one of my colleagues is also known as the Raven Master. And he has the responsibility of looking after the birds and their welfare as well as conducting his normal duties. Now, it's the 21st century. And quite clearly, it is a lot of superstitious nonsense. <laughs> However, just to make sure, we've got seven ravens. <laughs> right, guys, we're going to walk that way towards Tower Green now. Let's go. I'm going to get this picture. <laughs> right, guys, come on, come on, come on, you come. Come, come around this way as well. There we go. Here we are then, ladies and gentlemen, we finally made it. Here we are on Tower Green, the village green of the Tower of London. However, Unlike most quintessential English village greens, we have something quite unique on ours, as we have our very own execution site. Look at that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> now that small paved area there with that hideous glass coffee table on it is not to be confused with the public scaffold we talked about up on Tower Hill. 
You may or may not know that actually only six people were ever officially sanctioned to be executed here by beheading, three of which were Queens of England. But before I tell you any of that, I'll just tell you about some of the buildings that surround us. Now, should you wish to find out more about the two-boy princes and the remarkable imprisonment of Sir Walter Raleigh for 13 years, you will find the bloody tower entrance straight down that way, guys, okay? Worth having a look at in there. Sweeping round to my right, we've got an L-shaped building right in the corner here. This building here is known as the King's House. It's known as the King's House because it's the King's House. <laughs> now, it stands on the site of a much older building which originally served as the Lieutenant's Lodgings. However, due to complaints made by Sir Edmund Walsingham, who was the Lieutenant in the reign of Henry VIII, it was agreed to advance the sum of money required to totally rebuild it. And what we have here is the result. This is a perfectly preserved Tudor residence that still serves as the home of the resident constable of the Tower of London and his family. Now, being the home of such important officials, it's obvious some very important prisoners were accommodated there from time to time. For example, Queen Catherine Howard, fifth wife of Henry VIII, she was held there prior to her execution. William Penn was another famous prisoner held in the King's house for his offensive writing. Even so, as a prisoner, he still managed to compile this very controversial pamphlet called No Cross, No Crown. And he was only released on the provision he leaves the country. And so, being from a rather wealthy and influential family, he then sailed across the Atlantic to found his famous Quaker colony, Pennsylvania, yeah. named in honour of his father. Right, who's from Pennsylvania then? <laughs> yeah, quite a few. Yeah. You must be so proud that your founding father was a career criminal. <laughs> right, in the centre here, guys, we've got the Beecham Tower. Again, have, have the time, have a look in there, especially up the stairs behind that tall arch window. Up the stairs, you'll find some really notable inscriptions carved in the walls by some of the prisoners held there. Some of those carvings are well over 450 years old and definitely worth having a look at should you have the time. Uh, going round this way to my left, we have got the very beautiful Chapel Royal of St Peter ad Vincula. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the resting place of three queens of England and two saints and 1,700 other unidentified remains. Yep. Now, again, it would be on my to-do list should we visit the tower, so should you visit there, gents, as long as your religion permits, kindly remove your headdress before you go in for me. Thank you. Also, guys, a quick tip, word of warning, really. Now, at the entrance, which is over here, guys, at the door, we've got a small ramp. It's about that size, about that angle. <laughs> yeah, got it? Ladies and gentlemen, if you visit the Chapel Royal behind me, at the door, there's a small ramp about that size, that angle. Be careful, eh? Yes? Guys, if you go to the church behind me, we've got a small ramp at the door. It's that size, that angle. Yes? Yeah. Yes. Got it? Yes. Why, why is at least 15 of you still going to fall over it then? <laughs> now, ladies, fear not. As if one of my gentlemen colleagues is in there, he'll be stationed right next to that door. And despite his age and his ailing limbs, as you do very gracefully stumble and fall, he will quickly cut his arm to you and then he'll break your fall for you. And then he will hold you there for what you think is a really uncomfortable amount of time. <laughs> Gentlemen, that floor is absolutely solid, by the way. <laughs> right behind us, guys, here we've got the Waterloo block. Now, this building here stands on the site of the Grand Storehouse, which was totally destroyed by fire in the year 1841. This building was erected in 1845 as a new barracks for the then 1,000 soldiers of the Towers Garrison. It now houses the Jewel House, which can be entered by way of the doors beneath that large golden clock. And obviously this is where the Crown Jewels are situated, yeah? And obviously, as you can see, there's absolutely no cue to this, so it'll take you minutes to get in there, guys, if not seconds. Also, I do believe there's a spring sale on. And so the Crown Jewels have got 20% off of any of the <laughs> Right, shall we get back to execution, yes? Yes! yes. Okay, now, as I said, six people executed here, three of which were Queens of England. Now, our first victim on the 19th of May, 1536, was probably the most famous, Queen Anne Boleyn, second wife of Henry VIII. Now, Anne had been tried and found guilty on trumped-up charges of adultery, incest, witchcraft and high treason. She was executed at her own request, not with an axe, which she said to fear greatly but in a French manner, with a two-handed, double-edged sword. Now, Anne's last words on that scaffold that morning were akin to Lord God. Have pity on my poor and miserable soul. 
but she is said to repeat it over and over and over again. Now, so swift and sure was that French execution with that blow that as he picked up her severed, still bleeding head, <laughs> those assembled there that day gasped in absolute horror. <laughs> 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 They were so horrified, they felt compelled to gasp a second time. <laughs> As Anne's eyes were seen to still move in the sockets, oh. and she continued to silently mouth the prayer she'd been saying, Lizard Man. The lady did not even know she was dead yet. Now, I can see a few skeptical looks again, but it's true. <laughs> There is various eyewitness accounts that attested to this, and there's even a scientific reason for this, ladies and gentlemen. But that's really boring. <laughs> now then, five years later in 1541, the axe fell on the neck of a lady named Margaret Pole, the Countess of Salisbury. Now this dear lady had committed no crime. Neither was she afforded the luxury of a trial. She was, however, the mother of Cardinal Reginald Pole a bitter opponent of Henry VIII. And it was the Cardinal the King would have dearly loved to get his hands on. But he was safe in Rome, preaching against Henry. And so as Henry couldn't get the son, he therefore took his mother. And he had her executed here in his place. Now, so quickly was this arranged, there was no time to build the scaffold. They put straw on the ground and they put the wooden block in the centre. There was no time to summon the normal executioner. And so a young, inexperienced man was found that very morning. And he was told, Sir, you, sir, today shall be our executioner. Yay. Now, this dear 70-year-old lady refused to lay her head on the block. She declared proudly, it is for traitors, and I am not such. So now panicking, what does our executioner do? Well, where she stood, he picked that axe up and he hacked and he hacked and he sliced and he hacked until eventually she lay motionless at his feet in a pool of blood. Take a look at that face, ladies and gentlemen. Remember that time for the rest of your life now. Now then, the following year, on the 13th of February, 1542, the axe very unusually fell twice on the same day. This time our victims were Queen Catherine Howard and her lady-in-waiting. Now Catherine was executed for her associations with other men, both before and during her marriage to Henry. But it was to be her affair with a man named Thomas Culpepper, a gentleman at court that ultimately proved to be Catherine's undoing. On the scaffold, Catherine spoke to the assembled crowd and she stated, I die today the Queen of England but would rather die the wife of the only man I have ever truly loved, Thomas Culpepper. Oh, what a sweet thing to say at oh. such a time. <laughs> Culpepper didn't think so, he was at the back like this. <laughs> <laughs> Be quiet! <laughs> Thomas Culpepper was executed. Oh. He was taken to Tyburn, where marble arches these days, up by the end of Oxford Street, where he was hung, drawn and quartered. Now, Catherine's lady-in-waiting, Jane the Viscountess of Rochford, who was Anne Boleyn's sister-in-law, was executed immediately after her on the same blood-soaked, sticky, gooey scaffold. And her crime was that she knew of her mistress's adultery, but had neglected to tell the king. Now then, it would actually be another 12 years before the axe fell again here. This time the victim was the tragic, innocent, 16-year-old, uncrowned queen of only nine days, Lady Jane Grey. Now, Lady Jane was actually just a pawn in a struggle for power. After the death of her young cousin, King Edward VI, she had been declared queen, then placed on the throne by her ambitious relatives. And she ruled in the White Tower for just nine days until the rightful heir, Mary Tudor, regained the throne by force of arms. Now, Jane and her young husband, the 19-year-old Lord Guilford Dudley would eventually return back here to the tower under sentence of death after their trial for treason at London's Guild Hall. Jane was imprisoned in the gentleman jail association, number five, Tower Green, which if you look down that way, is the second green door down. Now the building at that time would have been very different to the one we have here today, but she's said to have watched at a window 
as her husband was taken from the Beecham Tower up onto Tower Hill for public execution. She would almost have certainly had the thousands of people gathered there that day cheering as his head was taken from his body, unless an aircraft was blown across. <laughs> as she said to watch and witness a headless, lifeless corpse being returned in a handcart for this bur for burial in this very chapel here. And if all that wasn't enough for any 16-year-old girl to take in, she would have no doubt seen carpenters preparing a scaffold, ready for her very own execution later that same day, the 12th of February, 1554. Now, in my personal and humble opinion, it is possibly one of the most tragic days in English history, ladies and gents. OK, then. If you've all been paying attention, and I know you have, you will all no doubt worked out that all our victims here thus far have all been ladies, yes? yes. Let's change that. Because in the year 1601, the axe fell on the neck of one Robert Devereux, the second Earl of Essex, a very good friend of Queen Elizabeth I. He had been entrusted to take an army across to Ireland to quell a rebellion. But instead of doing this, Robert Devereux brokers the truce against the Queen and the Privy Council's orders. Worse, Robert Devereux then comes back to England again against the Queen's orders. Now, fearing for his own safety, Devereux hatches a plot to kidnap Queen Elizabeth I, then rule in her stead. But he found very little support for this treacherous idea, and he paid the ultimate price for failure here on Tower Green on the 25th of February 1601. Now, ironically, our execution for this was a man named Thomas Derrick. Now, Thomas Derrick had been serving life in prison for various heinous crimes, but he'd been issued a pardon. He'd been given a pardon on the provision he becomes an executioner. And the man that gave him that pardon, one Robert Devereux, the second <laughs> Earl of Essex, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, fate indeed, fate indeed. Now, <coughs> unfortunately, I'm all out of executions. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> But if you give me a few more minutes of your precious time, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the Yoma Warders. How's that, sir? Yeah? Yep. OK, guys. Now, ever since the White Tower was completed around the year 1100, people have watched and they've warded over the buildings here and its prisoners. These were the first ever Yeoman Warders. And if you look at some of my colleagues around here today, you would think they'd been here since the year 1100. <laughs> <laughs> now we get to 1549, and a man named Edward Seymour, the first Duke of Somerset, is spending the first of his two incarcerations here at the Tower of London. But on this occasion, he was released, and he had an audience with the King after that. And at the audience, he said to the King, Sir, the Yeoman Warders at the Tower of London are absolutely fantastic at the job they do. Can you bestow an honour upon them? And the King agreed. He agreed to make the Yeoman Warders at the Tower of London part of his personal bodyguard in extraordinaire. And ever since then, all the Yeoman Warders at the Tower of London have been sworn in as the Sovereign's bodyguard in extraordinaire. Uh, these days, obviously, it's a ceremonial role, yeah? But in doing so, guys, we do become members of the Royal Household. Thank you very much. Yes. There's no need to bow or curtsy, we're OK. <laughs> now, we get to the year 1826, and the Duke of Wellington, he turns up as the new constable, and he takes up residence in that lovely house down there. And he's less impressed. He sees the Yeoman Warders as lazy, dodgy, drunken layabouts. <laughs> Some of which he would sell their positions on illegally, or even sublet their jobs out here to go and work elsewhere. So he then decides from that point on, only gallant, deserving and notorious ex-sergeants of the British Army shall be Yeoman Warders. The first of these was a man named John May from the Grenadier Guards in 1827. And ever since then, all the Yeoman Warders have come from the British Armed Forces and we've been numbered sequentially. We are now at number 422. I am number 414. So to be a Yeoman Warder these days, guys, you need to do at least 22 years in the British Armed Forces. You need to be the rank of warrant officer, or you may understand as a sergeant major, yeah? And you need to be awarded the Long Service and Good Conduct Medal, which is otherwise known as the Undetected Crime Medal. <laughs> <laughs> and as I said, there's 35 of us here at the town at the moment. We've got 20 from the army, yeah? They're easy enough to spot as you're going around, guys. They'll be the ones stood in the corner looking dazed and confused, <laughs> having completed a very simple task and wondering what they need to do now. <laughs> We've got four from the Royal Navy. Yes, 
Now it doesn't matter what time of year it is, they all insist on wearing big, thick, itchy roll neck pullovers <laughs> under the uniform. And they go around all day singing she shanties everywhere. <laughs> now we got three Royal Marines. Big, tough Royal Marines, yes. Can never be separated. All we're seen is a trio, holding hands, skipping along and singing lullabies. <laughs> and then there's eight intelligent people from the Royal Air Force. Yeah. Yeah. Three of us are from the Royal Air Force Regiment, which I had the honour, the pleasure and the privilege of serving in for 35 years, guys. Now, two questions we always get asked. One, where are the toilets? <laughs> two, how did you get the nickname Beef Ears? Yeah. Here's the answer, guys. We don't know. <laughs> True. There's no documented evidence that anyone's ever been able to find to say how, why, where, when we get the name Beef Ears. Yeah? There's lots and lots of theories out there. The two most prevalent are we got paid in beef or meat at one stage, or we got to eat beef or meat at the king's table as we were the king's bodyguards. But the truth is, nobody actually really knows, guys, yeah? So, if I've inspired any of you at all this afternoon and you do some research on this and you come across the answer, please let us know, because we'd love to know that one ourselves. <laughs> guys, we're nearly done. Suffice to say, if you've enjoyed the last hour yeah. and you yeah. go on TripAdvisor and you put a nice comment on there, my name's Tam, yeah? Yeah. If you go on the trip advisor because you've not enjoyed the tour, my name's Steve. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, I've been Yomo Ward of Tom Riley. Thank you very much for your time. I've had a blast. You enjoyed it? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Enjoy the rest of it. Now, if anybody's got any questions or has wants photographs of that, I'll be over there. Otherwise, go and enjoy yourself, guys. Thank you very much. Thank Cheers. You. Cheers. 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 Yeah. yeah. 